us astrophysicists love a good unsolved mystery. Because when you can't explain something that you've observed, you know that eventually you're gonna learn something new about the universe. And one of the biggest unsolved mysteries still in astrophysics is dark matter. Matter that doesn't interact with light at all, but it does with gravity so that we know that it's there. In the same way that we can't see the wind itself, but we know that it's windy because we can see the trees move. So there has been a pile of evidence growing over the past century in favour of dark matter, and yet we still don't know what it's made of. So, while the particle physicists fiddle with their big particle colliders trying to make or detect some dark matter, us astrophysicists are constantly trying to come up with new ways to try and detect some dark matter and test if it's there. The problem comes though when there is another unsolved mystery in the mix. Like the galactic centre giga electron vault excess. An as yet unexplained excess of gamma rays in the centre of the Milky Way. Gamma rays are some of the highest energy light there is. And what's exciting is that this could be a signal that there's a surplus of dark matter at the centre of the Milky Way, which would make those gamma rays the very first direct detection of dark matter in the universe. Which is very exciting if that's what this gamma ray excess actually is. There could be a whole host of other explanations for it. So, in this video, we're going to chat first about what is the galactic centre giga electron volt excess and how was it found, and then we're going to chat about the two main sort of front runner explanations for this excess of gamma rays. First, the dark matter annihilation explanation, and then the millisecond pulsars explanation. And then finally, we'll chat about how we can work out which is the correct explanation. And if you love unsolved mysteries on the cutting edge of science, just like this one, then you should definitely check out Nautilus magazine, who are the sponsor of this week's video. Nautilus is my favourite science magazine because it explores the big ideas in science, right? The ones that will still be debated long into the future. Now, Nautilus' stories extend across all disciplines in science, but I know all of you will particularly love their cosmos section, which explores the science and philosophy of the universe through dark matter to astrobiology, with an emphasis on entrepreneurial space exploration as well. Plus, along with their incredible science reporting, Nautilus is bursting with original artwork and illustrations, which have made Nautilus a winner of the ASME Best Style and Design Award. It's this merger of like science and art and culture and discovery that just make Nautilus stand out so much from like traditional science news sources and it's why I absolutely love it. You can join as a digital only member or in print to receive six beautifully illustrated award-winning collectible editions per year that honestly look wonderful on your coffee table. So join me in reading Nautilus by heading to joinnautilus.com forward slash Dr Becky and you'll get 50 15% off your subscription. So thanks again to Nautilus for sponsoring this video and now let's dive into chatting about what actually is the galactic center giga electron volt gamma ray excess. So this surplus of extra gamma rays was found by the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope back in 2009, specifically by the Large Area Telescope instrument that was on board that has a really wide field of view. So the area of the sky that it can look at with one observation at one time when you point the telescope, that is 20% of the entire sky. So it's a really big field of view, which means that it can actually get a full picture of the entire sky taken in gamma rays, the most energetic type of light there is with giga electron volt energies. They have the highest frequencies and the smallest wavelengths. They're like the big brother of X-ray light, right? Even more high energy produced by things like radioactivity and atomic bombs. Now, because they are the most high energy type of light, the objects in the universe that produce them are the most high energy objects and processes. So like when a star runs out of fuel and dies, it collapses, then rebounds in a supernova, an incredibly energetic process which gives out gamma rays or rapidly spinning dead stars called pulsars can also produce gamma rays. Or even if you have like a high energy particle that's thrown off say in a supernova, that can then have a high speed impact with like a, a gas particle in a nebula between stars and that can produce a gamma ray. So this is why you see them across the whole sky because there's lots of different processes that can produce them. Either individual objects that give you like the dots in this image 
or this diffuse sort of background and concentration of gamma rays that comes from the gas in our galaxy, the Milky Way, that runs along the middle of this image. And once we've got this image, we can then try and recreate what we've observed by trying to account for all the known sources of gamma rays. So the supernova and the pulsars and the gas in the Milky Way and black holes, including the Milky Way's central supermassive black hole as well. We know roughly how many of these objects there are in the Milky Way and we know roughly how much gamma rays they should be giving off based on the other kinds of light they're giving off. So we should be able to account for all the gamma rays that have been detected in this all sky image. But when we do that calculation for the very center of the Milky Way, there's extra gamma rays there that we can't account for. That's what this graph shows. So on the x-axis, you've got like position on the sky, which is looking towards the center of the Milky Way. And on the y-axis, how many gamma rays you've detected. The black line is the prediction from all the known sources of gamma rays. And the pink points is actually what was detected by the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope. And so you can see that in this energy range of gamma rays, you can see there is a surplus detected with almost two times the amount of gamma rays detected than expected. This is the galactic center giga electron volts excess. So what do we think is causing this then? What could be responsible for producing these gamma rays? And that brings me to our first of the two main sort of front runner ideas that have been raised to explain this, dark matter annihilation. So when this result of this galactic center giga electron volt excess was first spotted by the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, and it was first published by Goodenough and Hooper in 2009, and then more officially in a journal by Hooper and Goodenough in 2011, the first explanation for this that was given was gamma rays produced by dark matter annihilating. So in particle physics, if two opposite particles meet and collide with each other, like an electron with its opposite particle, the positron, then the two actually cancel each other out. They destroy each other, turn back to pure energy that's given out as gamma rays. Now a positron is an electron's antiparticle. It's what's known as antimatter. Antimatter is the opposite in every way to normal matter in the fact that it's got like opposite charge and opposite spin, but it is something we like we have actually detected. We know what it's made of. Like there are positrons and antiparticles in like bananas, for example. So don't confuse antimatter and dark matter. They're two very different things. But what particle physicists started to wonder was, well, okay, since we know this happens for normal matter, do dark matter particles also have anti-dark matter particles that can collide and annihilate with each other and produce gamma rays? Now in the leading hypothesis that particle physicists have for what dark matter is made of, dark matter particles are their own antimatter particles. So if just two particles of dark matter meet and collide, they should be able to annihilate each other and produce gamma rays. So it was thought that if there's an excess of gamma rays in the center of the Milky Way, then is it from an excess of dark matter colliding and producing those gamma rays? Because we actually do have some idea of where dark matter is expected to be in galaxies from our observations of other galaxies and working out their gravity, like we can work out where all the matter is. And then comparing that with all the matter that we can actually see in visible light, say stars or infrared if it's dust and accounting for all of the planets and things that don't give off their own light, then we know where all the normal matter is. And then taking one from the other, we can then say, okay, well then this is where the dark matter is. And so this is how we think dark matter is distributed in galaxies. It's called a Navarro, Frank and White profile after the three astrophysicists who first simulated this. And this nicely shows us that dark matter is densest in the center of galaxies, i.e. there's more dark matter found there. So if there's more dark matter particles, it's denser, there's more likely to be collisions. And if dark matter is its own antiparticle, it will annihilate and produce gamma rays. Not only that, but the detection that the Fermi telescope made was smooth. It extended out a few thousand light years and was very symmetric, right? It was the same in all directions. And that is exactly what you'd expect from a nice smooth distribution of dark matter like what you have in an NFW profile. So it's no wonder that the first time that this galactic center giga electron volt excess was observed, people connected these dots, checked if what they'd observed was actually, you know, fit by a dark matter annihilation model. And when it was, we're like, okay, well then can we put some constraints on what mass a, a dark matter particle would have to be to produce what had been observed? 
So you might be thinking, well then this gamma ray excess, this galactic center giga electron volt excess, like it doesn't sound like an unsolved mystery at all, Becky. That sounds like a nice neat little picture you've got there. However, a few years earlier in 2007, Boltz, Taylor and Waii had pointed out that dark matter annihilation gamma rays could get confused with gamma rays from other astrophysics objects also found in the center of the galaxy. And so it wasn't long before another explanation for the gamma ray excess appeared on the scene, which brings me to part three, the millisecond pulsar explanation. So as I said before, pulsars are the densest type of dead stars formed when a massive star goes supernova and dies. Now, because the star, when it was you know alive and when it was like fusing hydrogen into helium to produce heat and you know just be a normal star, because that star was spinning, when the star then died and collapsed down and got much denser, it continued spinning, but started to spin much faster. The same as an ice skater, when they're spinning and they pull in their arms to get more compact so that they spin faster. So pulsars spin incredibly fast. And as they do, they give out beams of radio light from their poles, which sweep around as they wobble and spin. And we detect them all across the universe, like lighthouses, flashing with radio light every second to a hundred seconds depending on how fast they're spinning. But it's not just radio light we detect from them. You guessed it, you also get gamma rays. But in the densest areas of a galaxy, like in star clusters or at the center of a galaxy, you get stars forming in pairs. And if one of those stars dies first and becomes a pulsar, then it can actually start to steal material off the other star thanks to its very strong gravity because it's so dense. And as it pulls in material from that other star, it starts to spin even faster down to like millisecond rates. These faster spinning millisecond pulsars are really long lived as well, which means they accumulate in the densest of places. So you find a lot of them all in one place. And we've seen this before in big star clusters. So the idea is that at the center of our galaxy, which is a very, very dense place with lots of stars, there should be a lot of millisecond pulsars as well, because they had a lot of time to accumulate there over billions of years. They should be giving out gamma rays as well as radio light. And that is what is causing this giga electron volt excess, this excess of gamma rays at the galactic center. We just didn't know to account for them in our estimates of how many gamma rays we should detect at the galactic center because we haven't detected that those millisecond pulsars are there with radio light like we do with the rest of the known pulsars. So why haven't we detected them then? But if they're so concentrated together, then their gamma ray light, their radio light should all blur into one in some of our telescopes that don't have a very high resolution. Plus the signals from them, the radio signals especially, will be very, very weak because those radio signals will you know, come out from the pulsars, but then impact with gas that's in between the stars in the center of the galaxy, where the gas is also denser as well. And that'll scatter away a lot of that radio light. One that makes sense from our other observations of the universe. And so there have been many scientific research papers published arguing one side of the argument over the other for many years since this gamma ray excess was first detected. Which which brings me to the final part of the video. How can we work out which is the correct explanation? Well, ultimately, this is all gonna hinge on the next generation of telescopes that should have enough of a resolution to zoom in enough to be able to resolve whether this gamma ray excess is smooth or clumpy. Smooth is what you'd expect from the dark matter annihilation picture because you just have this sort of like distribution of dark matter that, you know, is sort of more concentrated in the center. And clumpy would be what you'd expect if it was say the millisecond pulsars or some other astrophysical origin of like individual objects that are producing gamma rays that are all blurring into one at the minute. Luckily, we've got two new telescopes coming online in the next few years that should hopefully help to crack this. The first is the Cherenkov Telescope Array. It's the next generation of gamma ray telescope, which instead of one single telescope in space is a combination of many gamma ray detectors on the ground to make one giant telescope. The bigger the telescope, the smaller the thing on the sky that you can make out, which means we'll be able to zoom in more on that galactic center on this excess of gamma rays that have been found to work out is it smooth 
or is it clumpy? The second is the Square Kilometer Array radio telescope. Again, a huge array of many antenna on the ground to make one giant radio telescope to give the resolution to see small things, but also the sensitivity to detect faint signals. It should help us to detect any millisecond pulsars at the galactic center and work out how many there are there and how much of the excess they can account for. Is it half the excess or is it all of the excess? Like either way, that's gonna have knock on effects for the particle physicists and their ideas of like what dark matter is made of. Or if in a few years time, we haven't found any millisecond pulsars at the galactic center with the SKA and the Cherenkov telescope also showed that the excess still appears smooth, then we could finally conclude that what's been detected with this galactic center giga electron volt excess is the first direct detection of dark matter in the universe, perhaps solving two unsolved mysteries in one fell swoop. These faster spinning pulsars are very long lived as well, which means that they can accumulate where you have like the densest amount of, that's a pit pair floating in frame, got it washing machine is going downstairs. I don't think you can hear it, which is very loud. I think it's on its spin cycle. Where was the drink that I, I definitely brought a drink up. Was that they annihilate with? Does dark matter particles, or do dark matter particles, damn it. Tenses, tenses? No, I don't even know what that's called in English language construction. Does do, Ten tenses? No, I don't know. Space is hard, words are harder. 